This is Science Friday. I'm Kathleen Davis. I think about the natural world a lot, that it's full of wonder and beauty, but also that it is in crisis. And I think about this when I read the latest scientific paper about the impacts of climate change, but also when I'm on a walk and I see a weed like mugwort that's resilient against all odds. Robin Wall Kimmerer has thought deeply about the reciprocity between humans and plants by drawing on both her scientific expertise and indigenous wisdom. Dr. Kimmerer is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, and she is the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. She is also the founder and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, based in Syracuse, New York. And last but not least, she recently received the MacArthur Genius Award. That is quite a resume. Dr. Kimmerer, welcome to Science Friday and congratulations on such a high honor. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you as a regular listener of Science Friday. I'm, I'm, I'm just really excited. We are so excited to have you as well. And just to note, this conversation was recorded in front of a live Zoom audience. For more information about future live recordings of the show, you can go to sciencefriday.com slash live stream. So to begin, Dr. Kimmerer, I want to ask a little bit about the title of your book, which is Braiding Sweetgrass. Tell me a little bit about the significance of this plant and why you decided to use it to really weave together the essays in your book. Mm. Well, sweetgrass, who is known as wingashk in our Potawatomi language, is a sacred plant for our people, and it has so much um, to teach us about relationship with the living world. And, you know, I happen to have here on my desk a braid of sweetgrass, and it has such a wonderful vanilla fragrance, it, it really does smell very sweet. And, you know, Linnaeus gave this plant the name Hyra Chloe odorata. And when you translate that botanical Latin, it means the sacred fragrant holy grass. So um, he got it right. And for me, it's the dominant metaphor of the, of the book, because one of the reasons we braid sweetgrass is as a sign of our, our tan, a tangible sign of our care for Mother Earth, because in our creation stories, Wingash is the hair of Mother Earth. And so when we make a sweet grass braid, we're making a statement about our caring relationship with the Earth. And the three strands that make up that braid and make up the braid of the stories that are in braiding sweet grass are a strand of Western science. I am a trained plant ecologist in the Western tradition. But I'm also a Nishnabekwe, Bodwe Wadmikwe, an indigenous woman. And so another strand of this is traditional ecological or indigenous knowledge. But importantly, both of those ways of knowing are human ways of knowing. And so the third strand in that metaphorical braid is the knowledge that the plants themselves hold. Essential. Oh, sorry, please. I was just going to say, so my way of thinking is, is how do we best care for Mother Earth is by using all of those knowledges, not just one. So going off of that directly, a central theme in your book is reciprocity with nature. So can you explain a little bit about what that means and how you came to understand your relationship with nature as reciprocal? Yeah, sure. Well, if we just look at the way that ecosystems function. We know that the so-called balance of nature, the structure and function of ecosystems is mediated by reciprocity, by give and take that we might call negative feedback loops in ecosystem sciences, right? And so this idea that we cannot just take without replenishment, that everything that we do has a, has a reciprocal consequence that we need to consider is well established in ecological sciences. What I like to think about is extending that to our role as human people in the ecosystems. In Western science, in the Western worldview really, we think about human people as outside of nature, and that if we have a relationship with the living world, 
it's altogether too often characterized as nothing more than consuming and in fact is a detrimental relationship. But the kind of reciprocity that I really try to invite readers into is the remembering that human people can be good for the land, that, that the ways that we interact with the land can in fact be very positive so that in return for everything that we are given by the land or everything that we take, um, we can give back. And, and so really the theme of the book is exploring all of those ways in which human people can give back to the land. Scientists sometimes have a very narrow way of uh, seeking to explain the natural world. Uh, they can use the scientific method, but there are so many ways as you explore in your book that we can think about nature and we can think about our relationship with nature. How do you think as somebody who is a scientist, but also is incredibly thoughtful about all these things, I, how do you think about the relationship between scientific inquiry and other ways of understanding plants like indigenous knowledge? Mm. Well, really for too long, I think, after what let's be honest about was deliberate erasure of indigenous ways of knowing by the boarding schools, by the assimilationist history, that we're now to a place where we're recognizing that Western science, incredibly powerful way of knowing, um, has limitations. And some of the things that we most need to consider and understand lie outside the realm of the scientific method and the ways that we generate knowledge in that pretty reductionist materialist way. And so we are coming into a time, I think, of real intellectual pluralism of instead of having an intellectual monoculture dominated only by Western science and Western worldview, we're on the cusp of, of, of embracing uh, intellectual pluralism and, and multiple ways of knowing. And as a result, I think we can care better for one another, for the land. And in fact, we can do better science when we consider all of these streams of evidence and, and assumptions about the living world. So your book, Braiding Sweetgrass, came out nearly a decade ago, uh, which shocked me, to be honest, when I read the book, because it feels very timeless, but also very um, urgently modern in some ways. Um, but since, uh, since it was published, it has become truly beloved by readers, and it has gained a lot of word of mouth popularity. In 2020, it made the New York Times bestseller list. What is it, do you think, about this current moment that your book is resonating so much with people? It's such an interesting question, isn't it? Because by and large, we don't think about the, the public as either reading about plant science or reading about indigenous knowledge systems. And yet, um, breeding sweetgrass is really connecting with people. I think about it in a way as a reflection of what I hear from readers every single day is a kind of a longing to reconnect to the living world. And in a time of, of on the cusp of climate catastrophe in the age of the sixth extinction, I think we are really reconsidering what does it mean? What are our responsibilities to the land? How can we make this happen? Um, how, why are we complicit in the destruction of this beautiful planet? And, and braiding sweetgrass is a kind of a reminder. It's, it's a kind of an invitation to remember a different way of being in connection with the living world and thinking about how do each of us contribute to a restoration of right relationship to land. So my, my thinking about that is, is that it really reflects a longing um, from human people to support the more than human people. We have our first audience question that I'm going to turn to. This is from Vanessa who has a question about uh, advice you may have for students like her. Go ahead, Vanessa. Um, Dr. Kimmer, thank you for this beautiful book. Um, it's a braid of a book. 
Um, thank you for sharing the, the poetry and the science and the story all together. Um, I am wondering, uh, when faced with your interdisciplinary interests, one of your science professors invited you to leave poetry behind and focus on the language and analysis of science. With this lived experience, what advice did you share, do you share with your students who have interdisciplinary interests like you had? Thanks, Vanessa. I'm grateful that for the most part, this, this um, compartmentalization of, of science and, and art or science and other ways of knowing is really beginning to break down. What I tell my students is that I want so much for them to be bilingual, to be able to write and speak in the language required of Western science. There are really good reasons for the ways in which we communicate, but they have real limitations too. And so what I ask my students to do is not only master the peer-reviewed technical article, but also to embrace their responsibilities as a science storyteller and to use other tools to, to enable the public to connect with the work that we do. I feel that it's, in my life, it's been such a privilege to be a plant scientist, to spend my life on my knees before plants. It, it feels to me that in return for that gift, I have the responsibility of sharing that wonder, of sharing that knowledge and insight that the plants have shared with me with a broader public. And so I just encourage my students to do that. I encourage my students to bring their whole selves to science in a way that I was not encouraged to do as a beginning scientist, um, but, but I, I, I trust that that is changing because we know that we do far better work when we bring our whole selves to it. I wanna talk a little bit about the language that we use to talk about nature, uh, which is something that you, you just touched on a little bit. In the book, you write about how in English we use it, pronouns to talk about plants. So I would say, um, oh, that pumpkin over there, it's looking extra orange. Um, whereas I would never say that about a person, right? I would never use it pronouns for a person. But you argue that using it is really limiting our appreciation and understanding of plants. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you for surfacing that because it's such an interesting pattern in the English language that forces us to speak of members of the living community as if they were objects. It is inherent in the language and is a component of, of, of much of scientific thinking as well, the objectification of, of the living world. And when I began studying Potawatomi language, particularly Potawatomi verbs, and realized that in my native language, it was impossible to say it about a bird or a butterfly or a maple tree. We use the same grammar of respect and relationship for our, our plant and animal relatives as we do um, one another, members of our own family and, and species. And so I think that is a powerful example of the cultural assumptions about the living world that live in these two different worldviews. And I have to think we would live in a really different world if we spoke of, of the beings around us as beings, as relatives, and not as natural resources. We would have a, a very different ethical uh, implications of all of our actions if we thought of nature as subject and not as object. We have an audience question that really comes out of this theme as well from Beth, who uh, has a, a specific question about the phrase human people. So the, the question that Beth had was to, um, to ask you to explain why you use the phrase human people. Oh, happy to. And, and the very fact that the question needs to be asked answers the question. Among our, our own species, we are embedded in this worldview of human exceptionalism that says that our species is 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 fundamentally different 
and superior to all other species. And so we say that we are people, we are persons, and um, everyone else is, is a, I don't know, an ecological entity, a biological entity, a, a thing. Um, so I very intentionally talk about human people to draw equivalence between the importance of human people and moss people and tree people and, and, and bird people. Um, it's really embedded in the indigenous worldview of all my relations, which doesn't convert other species into objects or lesser than. It says that we're all members of the democracy of species. And um, so I, I'm very intentional with that, that language to create inclusion and, and, and kinship relationships um, with other species. And you know the science is very good on on the nature of our our relationship with the more than human world. We are more alike than we are different. We have a, another good audience question from Cindy. Um, so Cindy's question is: What is your definition of wilderness? And does the world word wilderness mean something different to the Potawatomi people than maybe it does to? European immigrants to this country? What a great question. You know, this idea of wilderness, which is so embedded in, in particularly in American culture, this idea that there are places in nature where humans don't belong, where humans have had no impact, is all part of this idea of, of the pristine, the untouched world. And that view is mythic. Um, when the settlers first came here to Turtle Island, they looked at the land and they thought, oh, this is wilderness, um, untouched by human hands. What was invisible to them was indigenous science, was indigenous land care and management that virtually every part of, of Turtle Island of North America had been influenced by indigenous land management, tending practices, cultural provisioning, et cetera. So to me, there, there really is a problem with the word wilderness because it puts human people outside of this community of beings. And um, I think what it, it reinforces the idea that there's nature over there and people over here and, and leaves out the potential for mutual benefit between people and, and the land. Which is not to say that we should not fiercely protect places from extraction, and development, but in this, the same time that we're doing that, we also invite mutually beneficial relationships between people and place. We have a really excellent question from Christine, who has a question about the role of ceremony in our lives. Christine, please ask your question when you're ready. Hello, hi. Um, First of all, thank you, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer. I can't believe I'm talking to you. Um, thank you so much uh, for braiding sweetgrass. It's been a real inspiration, not just for me, but for many people in uh, my community. I live in Sofmi, uh, also known as Northern Norway. And the question I have is, um, so I'm a, a child of immigrants from Asia and I'm culturally hybrid, like a lot of people. And I feel, sort of listening to the needs of my community, I feel the deep need for what um, you wrote, the elders uh, call the invitation to remember to remember, which is ceremony. Um, and how might, ceremony be available to people like me who are culturally hybrid, I have experienced very awkward moments of things that feel not appropriate and, and, and more like, um, or, or more like appropriation. And so I'm curious as to um, just some guidance of, on how um, 
yeah, how, how that might be done in a more respectful way. I really appreciate this question because it speaks to the longing that we have for right relationship with land and the way that ceremony can um, help reinforce that, or in fact, in, in some cases, create it. But I'm grateful to you for raising the question of cultural appropriation, because altogether too often in the absence of um, let's say inherited heritage ceremonies, there is a tendency to want to borrow them, to take them from other cultures, i.e. engage in cultural appropriation. And this is to be avoided at all costs for so many reasons, but the one I want to focus on it in the moment is this longing to use ceremony as a way to connect with land. The way that that connection happens is through what I think of as authentic ceremony, ceremony that, that is true to the roots of what ceremony means, which is to create intentional space to bring one's whole being through artistic, spiritual, emotional, mental, physical relationship um, with, with the land um, or, or with, it, with whatever entities you are, you, you are engaging in. And so to me, the most important ceremonies are the ones that are genuine, that come from your heart, from your relationship with place being grateful for a clean drink of water or grateful for birdsong in the morning is uniquely human. Um, it is not culturally specific. The best way I think to engage in ceremonial relationship with place and not to appropriate it is to let it develop organically out of an intimate relationship with place. I, I want to ask you about one of my favorite chapters in Braiding Sweet Grass, which is about the three sisters, the relationship between three different plants, corn, beans, and squash. You write about how these three plants nourish each other and support each other so that they can grow to the, their best selves. Can you tell us a little bit about why you chose to write about this? Yes. First of all, the agricultural symbiosis of the three sisters is a living example, both historic and, and couldn't be more contemporary, um, of indigenous science. Indigenous science embodying some of these principles we've been talking about. Um, we call them the three sisters. We speak of them as if they were people, as if they were persons. And why the Three Sisters Garden produces more food than growing those species alone. It's better for the soil than if they were grown in monoculture. Um, there's more complete nutrition by growing them together than apart. And so to me, the, the, three, the practice of planting and harvesting the Three Sisters embodies the indigenous worldview. Um, and it's an example of indigenous science. I think it's also a really powerful metaphor for the potential relationship between Western science and indigenous science. Um, that in a three sisters garden, each the, the garden works because each of those plants is sovereign. Each of them brings what they bring. Um, a three sisters garden is not blending of those of those. Uh, species, um, it, it is allowing their complementarity to shine, to bring them into relationship. And that's what I really strive for and hope for in my, in my research and my writing and my teaching is to create a knowledge garden of, of Indigenous and Western sciences together, where there's no compromise of the very different identities of those ways of knowing, but that they can work better to care better for the land and for people. And that idea really pushes back against monoculture farming, which is so prevalent in Western society. And it's what many of us were raised to see as the quote unquote correct way to farm. Um, so I just really love that story. I think it's so fascinating. 
This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. If you're just joining us, I'm speaking with Robin Wall Kimmerer, author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. We have time for one more question. I want to take it to Titus, who has a question about invasive species. Go ahead, Titus, whenever you're ready. All right, thanks. Uh, great to, to talk to you, Dr. Kimmerer. Um, so yeah, my question is uh, kind of back to language again. So much of the language around invasive species control and management can be very militaristic or aggressive. I mean, even invasive species itself. Um, but these species aren't here on their own. We brought them here. Um, so how can Western scientists build relationships with indigenous peoples to address these hard problems like invasive species? Thanks for that question, Titus, because I think this is a really excellent example and opportunity for a symbiosis of knowledges. You know, as a member of the, of the plant conservation community, there, there's no denying the harm that as can be done to, to native plant communities from um, overpopulation by, by exotic species, for sure. Um, but there's often a knee-jerk reaction in the conservation community to say, well, if it's not native, if it's exotic, it's necessarily bad, as if colonizers were somehow inherently bad, which I think is a very interesting, has very interesting political overtones and social overtones as well. What if we took seriously the idea of the intelligence of plants, of the personhood of plants, before we, we brand them as, as beings who need to be eradicated, shouldn't we first ask the question, why are they here? Um, what are they doing here? What are the gifts and responsibilities that those plants are bringing here? Um, and think about the ways in which um, plants from other places can become integrated into or naturalized into, into our ecosystems. Um, so my approach is, is one to respect those plants, to um, get to know them, rather than um, the first response being to eradicate them. Our job as, as, as human people, I think, is to create balance. And that, that's really what we would strive for with these, with, with these plants that have, have come to our shores, is, is, to, is to create a, a balance with them so that everyone can thrive. What a wonderful way to end this conversation. That is all the time that we have. I would love to thank my guests for such a wonderful conversation. Robin Wall Kimmerer, the author of Braiding Grass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. She is also the founder and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, based in Syracuse, New York. Thank you so much, Dr. Kimmerer. What a wonderful conversation. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure. <laughs>